Quarantine questions. We are here with Zach Stubbledy Cook, uh, Olympic gold medalist. I'm so delighted to be here chatting with you, Zach. How are you going today? I think, yeah. Oh, oh, there we go. We got the mic sorted. Oh, hang on. Have we got you now? I think. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> Zach Stubbledy Cook, uh, yeah. how are you? Yeah, good. And thanks for having me. I'm, yeah, surviving in quarantine up here and now. Uh, can sympathize that much more with everyone back at home. So, of course, all the swimmers, you guys are up at Howard Springs. How has it been at the moment? What have you been doing to keep yourself busy? Oh, we've been trying to keep our bodies moving a bit um, with workouts on our balconies, like socially distance and masks on outside. But, yeah, between that and just uh, taking a breath and catching up on some sleep, it's, um, yeah, it's pretty good, actually. It's not too bad. I can imagine. Have there been many other people sort of in quarantine who aren't athletes up at Howard Springs that kind of feel a little bit guilty that they're not out quarant- um, exercising on their balconies as well? Uh, there's like um, quadrants here up in Howard Springs. So you can see there's like a fence line up a bit further past our building. And um, they, yeah, you can see that they're public and see that some of them are exercising and some of them aren't, but maybe we hopefully we inspired a few of them. Are the swimmers, are you guys all close together? Yeah, we've got like a quadrant and it's all in alphabetical order. So I have uh, Ariane Titmus and Brianna Throssell and Kim Elverton, Dave Morgan and Tommy Neal all next to me. And it's, it's yeah, they're actually outside the exercising now. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good company that you're in there. Uh, I, I want to get started. We had, uh, we had a lot of questions in and make sure if you're watching now, if you've got more questions for Zach, leave them in the comments because we will see them. We'll try and get through as many as we can. But one that I really wanted to start with, uh, just to go back to the very beginning, Isaac Poole over on Instagram asked, how old were you when you started to take swimming seriously? When did it really start for you, Zach? I think I started to take swimming really seriously probably when I was about 14 or 15 um there's a number of points where I did question whether I wanted to keep swimming and that happened as recently as cope during COVID you know uh, life was pretty good without swimming and had a lot more time on my hands and was really pursuing other things in my life and um, made a choice obviously to keep get back in the pool after two months but I think a short answer is um yeah, when I was 14, I missed, like, it was the first time I was beaten by Matt Wilson, who's a, <laughs> still a teammate now. And, um, yeah, so that was the first time I was beaten by him. And that was the first time I kind of went, oh, this sucks, not not, not winning. Um, and then again, when I was about 16, I, or just about 17, sorry, I decided to take a, three years senior. So I decided to stand, extend my schooling and was lucky enough that the school accepted that. And, um, you know, that's when I kind of had to make a choice of like, I'm going to put an extra year of my life to have a crack at, a crack at swimming. And, mm. you know, I went to world juniors in my last year of school and that was such a great privilege to be able to do both and still then have Commonwealth games the year after and so on. So I guess does that answer the question all right? <laughs> I think that's a pretty good answer. Was it always breaststroke for you? Was it always pretty clear, clear early on that that was the stroke that you, took you most? Yeah, I think there's an old saying that it's like breaststroke is a born, not made. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I've always done breaststroke since I was nine years old. Like that was my first national champs, um, national school champs when I was nine years old in Perth. And I was, I, swear, I flew all the way over to Perth for a 44 second race. <laughs> um, <laughs> And yeah, I've always swum breaststroke. I've always dabbled in IM and actually won like a, I've won a national medal in the fly race, believe it or not. If you saw my okay. butterfly now, you'd probably question that. But <laughs> I, sw- I swam all the strokes probably up until I was, up until I finished high school, like I, at my last school meet, so the GPS championships up in Queensland. I, I swam the 200 free in my last year and the 200 IM. So I've always tried to, do a lot and do the across the board, but the focus is always pressure. Another question we had from Alice was how did you manage swim training and school when you went to school? Was it a big uh, balance that you had to try and achieve there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's probably two things there. I, I, the main thing, I guess, 
about my story is that you are a person before you're an athlete. And like, I can't harp on about that enough. And it sounds so cliche, but at the end of the day, when you are training, you're, you're, that's, that's a pursuit of your values and finding your edge and finding that limit of yourself and seeing where, where you lie and finding yourself. And for me, I try and pursue excellence in a lot of walks of life. Um, and that's probably just the person I am and something that I value. And coming back to that, I was told a piece of advice a long time ago about an analogy about a bucket. So there's this bucket. So imagine picture a bucket and you fill it with rocks, big rocks, like, you know, huge rocks, like, hmm. and you think it's full, right? And then you pour some pebbles in and each and then each piece and then you get smaller and smaller and smaller and all of a sudden you think it's full and then you wet it again and then it's not full and you pour it full of sand so for me it was about finding time where there wasn't time and probably the number one thing is not procrastinating obviously like taking big things out of your life that um yeah because there is a time and a place to see friends and family and use social media but the, i think i think we can all agree probably spend a little too much time on it uh, one other question i guess in this pre-olympic kind of cycle that we're talking about is one from sharon who asks about who inspired you to become a professional athlete athlete were there any athletes that you looked up to as a kid or you kind of wanted to go that's someone i'd like to try and replicate or try and be like um I've always drawn from all different people from not necessarily always athletes either. I think like um, probably when I started swimming, it was always like Phelps and I think he inspired a countless number of people. Like, you know, like even I, I've only ever experienced one Olympics and it was only last week. So mm. I, I cannot imagine how he did eight gold medals. Like it's just mind boggling. Like, and it's probably even more inspiring now that I've gone through a bit of what he experienced, but yeah. that is un unbelievable. And then the likes of like Brenton and Christian, like I was lucky enough, uh, Brenton Rickard and Christian Springer. I was lucky enough when I was younger to be on a number of a few, a few camps with them as they were kind of finishing their career. And that was always inspiring to see. Um, yeah. So. I mean, I think that answers are pretty well. Uh... Let's look at this sort of Olympic campaign. I mean, let's start a little bit before. Uh, was there much talk about, I guess, the last Olympics, Rio and London within the, the Dolphins group? Obviously, a lot has been made since the Games about how, how well you guys have done in comparison to the last Olympics. Was that ever something that was actually spoken about within the group? Um, not really. I think um, it was more about the culture moving forward um, mm. and what we wanted to ingrain in in the culture of the team and i think that's they've definitely reaped the rewards of that like that's been three four years in the making you know um i think it's it's such a great team and it's such a great atmosphere like we've all got each other's backs we're all friends we all have similar interests you know we all have same goals like we want to be the best we can be on the day and we all respect that we're all going to give that um hmm. And yeah, I, I guess that's that's a short and sweet answer to that question. I guess another thing that's been spoken about a bit is having the trials a lot closer to the games. It's the first time we've really seen Australia do that. And obviously, even though it's your first Olympic experience, for you personally and maybe chatting to others, did you guys feel that that made a bit of a difference? Um, probably not, but yes and no. Yeah. Um, I guess it was a bit of a different circumstance. So for everyone back home, um, this is the third time that I've done it and the second time a lot of other people have done it. Um, so last year or the year before last, 2019 Worlds was the first time everyone had to do it. Um, yep. The year before was a different qualification where some people had to do it and some people didn't. That's a whole nother swimming um, chat <laughs> and not politics or anything, don't worry. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it was beneficial to certain people and it definitely remain, kept you focused a lot quicker. Um, but this prep was a little different as well because we had a week at home and everyone who wasn't in Queensland had to be in Queensland basically the weekend, the day, the day after trials um, finished. 
So for some people, it's been a very long campaign, like the Perth guys that are here. So Taz and Bree are both, they've been away since our nationals in March, late March. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I've yeah. been home to Perth. Um, and Zach and Surdy as well in that list. And Mac and the New South Wales guys um, have been rushed, rushed, got rushed out as well. Um, just, just because of lockdowns and just because of the uncertainty. Um, and we actually got four hours notice. Even the Brisbane people got four hours notice before Brisbane went into lockdown quite a few weeks ago. Now it would feel like um, to get up to Cairns for and say goodbye to family for seven weeks. It was um, a confronting experience, but it was also like great because the team, everyone was so supportive and everyone was in a very similar position. And that comes back to the team culture of it all. So yeah, it was a, it was different, and I enjoyed it because we were a lot more focused and a lot more intense especially having to be in cans um was yeah it was really good going into the games uh did you have many expectations going into i guess this olympic campaign um the expectations for me were always to just to do my best that's what i was there to do and that's what i've always been striving to do to swim my best race in the olympic final um and obviously there's a few rounds before that to get in. And mm. um, I was probably, I'm not going to lie, I'm probably most nervous before the heats because after the 100 breasts, I was a little like, you know, the, the self-doubt chatter kind yeah. of go, starts and you have to kind of try and park that and really get on with it. Um, and I was lucky that I had the, the other guy that was quite very fast as well in my heat and had the opportunity to race him from the beginning and all the way to him being next to me in the final. So that was a great opportunity. But, and then in the semis and the finals, I was definitely, especially the semi final, like it was really enjoyable. I saw him yeah. freely and just, I was so relaxed. Like it was, it was, I, I don't even know how to explain it. It was euphoric. It was just like, I felt completely and utterly free. So I didn't necessarily go into the meet thinking I was going to, win um i just wanted to do my best and to come away with a win is just such a bonus well i guess let's talk about the race because that's the the big moment i guess for you coming out of these games i mean 206 38 olympic record time that you jump out of the pool with that must be a pretty special feeling but i guess for all of us sitting on our couch, couch at home watching you i think it was six at the first turn third of that final turn is that something that you just find that you do in a lot of your races that you, you come home strong yeah, that's um, my strength. And I knew it was the strength of the guy in lane one as well. He's the world record holder still. And that's that's the way he swims it. So yeah. for anyone at home, and probably a lot of people wouldn't know this, but there's like typically like the world's kind of divided in the 200 breaststroke to swim two different ways. And I'm more of a back end heavy swimmer. So I'll swim very close to 50 50, whereas a lot of the other guys will swim like a 60 40 race. So for Arno, he was out in 60 point fast, faster than what I went in the 100. <laughs> um, and and then he comes back in 107. So I'm coming back in 104 and he's coming back in 107, you know, but he saw it both ways. So it was quite interesting to see what he was going to do and how he was going to behave in that race. Um, yeah, and that's, that's the way I swim. And I think that's where I'll continue to swim. It, it it'll be interesting. I think there's there's a lot a lot a lot of room for improvement still, and I'm excited because like it, it was a great race and it was a great time. It was the second time I've been two oh six low, um, mm. but it wasn't a PB. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I want to show you one particular photo just of you getting in the zone. I guess before that that final what what's going through your head in this sort of moment before you're about to jump in the water you, you talked about how you kind of felt more nervous going into the heats but there must be plenty of thoughts racing through your head at this moment probably uh right before that moment i think like at that moment i'm kind of going through my rituals and going through my routine of getting ready and getting in the zone and i think there's a little smirk there i think um and i think i'm just trying to remind myself to have fun and enjoy the moment and be present um you know after after that it goes pretty blank um i i can remember bits and pieces of the race but it's it's 
yeah, you're in that kind of flow state that is like there's so much happening around you and so much going mm. on and yeah. A question on that, Lily Malthouse asked, uh, what music do you listen to to get you in the zone before competing? Is there anything in particular going through your playlist? Well, here you go. I have a bit of a routine now because I've, I've gotten it down to what I like. Um, I'll listen, it sounds weird, but like on the bus ride there, I'm trying not to get too amped up. I'm trying to just chill out a bit and conserve energy because I know when I get to the pool, it's going to be there's going to be a lot more tension. Mm-hmm. So I'll listen to a bit of like like lo-fi kind of um, hip hoppy kind of like very chilled like for example like a song called um, Heavy California by Jungle just to like chill out that kind of stuff it's just very summery vibe like relaxing music and then when I get to the pool I'll continue listening to that and then once I've kind of start my dry land I'll start to get a bit more amped up with. Typically, I have I have a bit of an old gym playlist from isolation that I was heavily leaning on um, when I was there. But otherwise, it's like before trials, it was some some old school Kanye West and Eminem. It was that heavier stuff that yeah, yeah. gets you really amped up. Is it the same sort of routine that you have before every race? Like you'll have, make sure it's the same songs and you'll put your cap on, your goggles on the same way, or are you not really as superstitious in that sort of sense? Um, I like routine and I like Mm. uniformity. Um, and like at the Olympics, it's 90% mental. So I was just trying to keep as many things the same as possible. So my mind didn't feel a threat because of the nerves that were happening and everything that's happening around you. Like Mm. to put it in perspective, everyone, like you stand behind the block and you look down the pool and there's like this giant logo of the Olympic rings. And then in front of that, there's like five or six cameras, like video, big video cameras. And then you have about 10 photographers in front of them. And then you have this spider cam that's kind of like flying into you. And like, then onto your left, it's like full of people that are photographers. And then on the other side, Mm. it's the same. It's like, there's a lot going on and a lot going around the pool. And then the guy next to you is making noises and slapping his chest and you're just like, it's there's a lot going on so i try and keep to the same routine because it like as me and my cycle have worked together and said you know it might look and feel different but at the end of the day it's the same it's the same distance in the pool it's the same water it's everything's the same but it might look and feel different but you got to keep continuing that it's the same thing I mean, had you ever experienced anything like that before? Obviously, you've competed before for Australia, but just on that level, was that pretty insane to experience? Yeah, and I think think I'm still coming to terms a bit with what sort of level it is and what sort of level it was. Like, there's a lot of buzz and I've experienced a lot of feelings and a lot of emotions over the last, especially the Mm. last couple of days being here. Um, It's kind of the come down of it all and, where I've landed and stuff with it all. Um, I think Commonwealth Games was the last time I felt the same amount and being at home with Commonwealth Games with a crowd was unbelievable and not having the same, yeah. not having the performance I wanted there um, really helped me to ensure that I was using routines and I was use, utilizing that mental side a lot more and training myself to have a bit more mental fortitude. A, a very popular question we had was when you hit the wall and you saw that one next to your name up on the, the scoreboard, how did you feel in that moment? Did did you have to take a second to process it all? Oh, absolutely. Like I touched the wall and was like, what? Did that happen? Like am I about to wake up kind of like thing? And, you know, and then I like kind of came to it and realised like what had just transpired. And I don't think it like I was just, fully kind of yeah such a high like i cannot describe in words how it felt in that very moment but it probably kind of hit me pretty hard when i watched the flag go up and heard the national anthem like that was a very very special moment that i will remember forever like i've seen it happen for a number of people i've seen it happen you know for relay teams and at Commonwealth Games and Pampax, et cetera, et cetera, you know. But to have it 
for you is unbelievable and the pride that it gives you and wearing that green and gold and having that medal around your neck and flowers in hand it was it's a special moment and it fills you with pride and joy knowing how many aussies are cheering you on and hopefully how many australians i've inspired for the future why did the swim team go so well this year i mean we had obviously yourself winning gold we had arnie winning gold we had kaylee winning multiple goals and the relays was there just such a strong vibe around the group? Like, it just looked like you guys were so close the whole time. Yeah, I think um, it's it's hard to pinpoint exactly what it was. Like, yeah. I've had this question a few times now, and I think, like, I've had a chat amongst some of the team, and, you know, I think it's a lot of it comes down to, like, all of us know we've got each other's back, but all of us, are confident in our ability and confident in being ourselves. Like it's quite a tight knit group that we're very accepting of new people. And, but I guess because, because of, I think it honestly, it could be partly because of last year and not seeing each other for so long. And I yeah, think okay. like longing to be together and have those moments and actually cherishing those moments a bit more. I think that, comes into it and obviously the values and the foundations that the team leaders have set definitely set the foundation for that i think just having a bit of time away from the sport and everyone kind of reflecting supercharged the feelings that they had and supercharged what they wanted out of the sport i think definitely helped and hopefully this supercharges it again <laughs> Obviously, you've come home with two medals. You, we've got that gold that you've been talking about. Then also in the, the medley relay uh, where you swam, obviously the breaststroke leg and the team came home with bronze. What was it like being involved in, I guess, a, a pretty historic, the first uh, mixed medley relay at the Olympic Games? And when did you kind of find out that you'd be swimming in it? I found out the night before my final um, of the two breasts. So Wednesday night um, last week. And I kind of just had to park it knowing that like whatever happens in the morning, I have to get up again for the team that night. Um, mm. That's the mentality I went in with. And the relay is always exciting. And it's the first time I've raced relays internationally and I got to race yeah, four. Um, so that was very exciting and like such a privilege to actually be part of team events. Like I've never experienced that before. Like, I'm never in marshalling with Kyle and Mitch Larkin, like, and yeah. then not only that, like Emma McKee and, and Kaylee and Matt Temple, it's like, it's a bit, wow. It's a bit of a, like, awe moment, you know, like you're standing among, well, you, you I was standing among, like, the greatest of all time, you know. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty special. And that really is really fun, a really fun and new event for anyone that doesn't know. It's just, yeah, all about, it's a lot, it's a lot more tactical than, and it changes yeah. hands a lot. And it's like interesting to watch from a fan's point of view and from a swimmer's point of view, because you know, like the U S they, they put Caleb Dressel last and like, you can see him swimming over the top of people and you're like, wow, like, yeah, it's, it's cool. It's fun to watch and it's amazing to race. And we were just focused on getting the four best swims we could out of ourselves and do the best on the day. I guess something that um, Thorpey raised on commentary here was that people might be commenting on Twitter or social media and go, oh, why haven't you guys put Kyle last against Caleb or whatever it might be? But at the end of the day, the list is submitted a little bit beforehand, aren't they? You don't actually get to see what other people are doing and then change your medley list accordingly. Yeah, you don't get to see that. And um, I think... Now, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure it will work off differentials. So for each for each team, it's all different. So for the US, they have a 58 breaststroker, but they have a 104 breaststroker as a female. So the mm -hmm. differential isn't as great as like their flyer to their male to female flyer, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. So if you can minimize that difference and have a faster team than the others. So that's GB's got quite a benefit of PD going, 55 high or 56 yeah. low in a relay and um you know so that's that and the us have the benefit of their their backstroker being the fastest in the world and it's it's a it's a tough choice because you know i think you have like as well i think size would come into it a bit too because 
you, when you have a female backstroker going against a male backstroker, if they get caught in the wash, it's difficult. Whereas breaststroke's not as bad swimming through wash um, as your freestyle and as your backstroke and your mm-hmm. flyers as well. So those kind of things come into play as well. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on both in both from watching it and from being in the pool. Have you ever seen a changeover like Kate Campbell's in that final four by one that they the girls won gold in? I mean, what was it? 0.04 seconds. Is that something that you guys work on? Or was that, I guess, almost a little bit of luck involved too in terms of she just timed that so well? Uh, yeah, so our changeovers, we always aim for 0.1 to 0.15. Um, <laughs> and a few people asked her after the race, you know, how was that? was that always the plan to go that fast on the changeover? And she said, yeah, I knew I had to push it. And to be fair, it's not her like closest changeover. And okay. Zach and Surti took out, the, <laughs> took out the tightest changeover at the Olympics. I think he was pretty sure he was negative 0.03, um, which you're allowed to be like slightly negative. Um, yeah. So, cause it's toe leaf and all that, all that geeky stuff. But yeah, you're allowed to be slightly negative. So he was negative and, um, yeah, Kate knew she had to push it. So I think she was she was willing to push it that day. And, yeah, it was a little bit of luck, I'm sure. <laughs> One thing we have to talk about is obviously Emma McKean, a quite incredible Olympics that now makes her Australia's most decorated Olympian of all time. I guess going into this Games, all the talk was about Arnie, about Kaylee, and while there was some talk about Emma, I feel like she did kind of fly under the radar and she's kind of proved herself this Olympics to everyone who maybe hasn't recognised her as much. And what sort of things does she bring to the team and how amazing is it to to say you're on the swim same swim team as potentially the greatest Australian Olympian of all time? Yeah, it's it's um, it's an honour, but it doesn't feel real, you know. It's just like, yeah. it's just Emma, <laughs> which is a nice way to be. Like, she's very, very humble and um, always calm and cool and very confident in the way she goes about herself. And I think, you know, when she's smiling, she's going to swim well, typically. <laughs> and she was happy this week, uh, last week, and happy being there and had a good group around her and a good group to support her. And I think this was always going to be like her battle and her her time to shine because I think a few of the swimmers kind of saw her at trials and was like, wow she is she's on you know um and her being our most successful like successful olympian at the last olympics um like came away with no individual goals but you know was right up there is even more impressive to come come back five years later and Mm. you know just prove to herself that she's still more than capable of being such an amazing athlete and to back up time and time again and like that medley relay, for example, she just swam the 53, did yeah. like four laps and then came back and swam 100 free. It was quite amazing to see her just like head down and park it and just like be like, all right, well, I'm here for the team now. It's, it's a very special, very special person. A couple of quick other questions that have been sent in. Uh, Tommy Kerr asked, without such a large crowd, did it make you perform, I think, your best and easier nerves, did it make you perform a little bit better knowing that there wasn't a lot of people watching? Um, yes and no, I think, because, you know, it's it's our pinnacle. Like, it's the pinnacle of our sport. Um, and for me, like, it, it, it means so much more, especially with a year delay and being, just being there was a privilege. But you know, there was still a lot of noise like between the Americans yeah. and the Australians and the um, Russian Olympic Committee. Like they were all making a lot of noise and there was a lot of noise in the crowd. But yeah, it, it does make it a little different, but I don't think it would have been that much different. I think like, yeah. I think maybe some of the Japanese would have stepped up a bit more. Like that may have been a thing because it would have been a lot of Japanese home crowd and home games. But I'm not sure, like, you know, I think I went in there with the best intentions, whether there was crowds or not. Another one in terms of after your race, uh, Kayla asked, ice bath or spa? 
what what do you prefer to hop into after a race um so i guess if you want the recovery protocol it's a like a thousand to two k swim down depending on when the next race is and then yep. a, a flush so that'll just be a very light massage just getting the blood moving and getting all the crap if you will out of the muscles and then a five minute ice bath at about 12 degrees and then typically i'll try and get some food in during that time as well so yeah that's what i'll do another one from lauren was i guess after the whole meat's done what was on the victory menu what's your your post competition meal or what's your cheat meal uh when i got here mum mum and the girlfriend sent a lot of chocolate <laughs> i'm like <laughs> what, what do you want to do me to come home fat like uh, um no when i got any any particular like, type of chocolate like what type of chocolate are we talking just Cadbury dairy milk blocks or favorite is the Whitaker's dark salted caramel chocolate with like okay. the filling. Oh man, it's so good. It's, it's just yeah, like nice. perfect. It's cl- close to perfection. <laughs> <laughs> um, but apart from that, like I'm really looking forward to getting home and having a steak and and celebrating with the family. I think that's what I'm probably most looking forward to. Yeah. Didn't really get to have too much of a victory meal in the village, like. It was much the same, same, um, because I was definitely still focused on performance. I guess one other food-related question that we had from uh, Opera House Dreamer on Instagram was, does pineapple belong on pizza? (laughs) No. (laughs) No? No, it does not? It was good to our our, our squad, we went out for pizza right before we went to our bubble in Cairns and, like, one of my teammates was like, oh, um, can I get extra pineapple? And I just looked at it. I was like, no, that's not okay. Like, I can't sit at the same table. Go on. Who, who is it? Throw them under the bus. Go on. Who, who's who's oh, getting Leah extra pineapple? Okay. Leah Neal. Four Le- by two. Leah Neal, uh, you've been called out here about pineapple and pizza. A um, <laughs> couple of other questions before we finish off. I guess looking forward to um, after quarantine, after you're out of here, after the 14 days there, what's next for you? You're just going to go home and kind of relax for a bit, take some time out of the pool? Yeah, I think I'll take a few, probably a week out of the pool. And um, after that, I think I'll start touching the water again and just a okay day and do a bit of fitness through cycling and through a bit of dry land stuff. But I definitely mentally just need a bit of a break from the pool. But I'm excited for what's next and I'm excited because I'm still very hungry for the next step. Like we've got Worlds the beginning of next year and we've got Commonwealth Games soon after that. And, you know, I'm racing overseas again at the end of this year. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for what's next and I'm excited to keep pushing. I think I saw, was it the the ISL, the, what is it, the Tokyo Frog Kings, is it, that have uh, yeah. picked you up? Are you, are you excited by that? Yeah, absolutely. Like I was um, pretty humbled when I got a call from Kaseki Kitajima, like the greatest breaststroker arguably of all time. Um, he's the only, he's the last person to win the double double. So two consecutive Olympics and two, the hundred and the two hundred breaststroke, yeah. and pioneered summer breaststroke. So for anyone that doesn't know that you can do one fly kick and the pull out. And he is the reason that we're allowed to do that. So he kind of like stretched the rules a little bit and they actually changed the rules to meet him. So he's a pioneer in the sport and someone that I was humbled to be asked to be on his team and excited to have the opportunity to race again. And, you know, it'll be fun to race a bit of short course against Arno and a few of the few of the very fast guys short course. Um, I'm excited. And obviously, 2022, big year. I mean, only a year off, but you got Com Games and you got World Champs in Fukuoka. That must be pretty exciting to have a real goal to, to like, you can quickly move on from the Olympics and it's straight on to the next big tournament. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm excited by the World Champs because I think after the Olympics, like, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of done it a lot, how a lot of people do go backwards. So a lot of people start with the Olympics and work their way down from the Olympics, but you know, I worked my way up from Commonwealth Games to Pan Packs to World Champs to the Olympics. And I'm pretty excited because I think looking back now, I'm like, man, Com Games was a lot less pressure and Com Games was a lot more relaxed. Like compared to this, like it's just very different. Um, and World Champs is the same. Like World Champs is probably uh, like a step up and a step up from Pan Packs as well. Um, and I think 
me racing a lot of Europeans as well. Like it's definitely a step up from Pampax, but yeah, it's exciting to see where everyone will be and where everyone will be at. Cause I think, you know, all of a sudden the hunter becomes the hunted and <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to, you know, I've always had the mentality. You've got to train like the second best in the world, even if you are the best. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good way to, to wrap up this. Uh, we can't wait to see what's next for you, Zach. I mean, if people want to follow you and catch you up on social media, we've been seeing all the athletes and the athletics recently dropping their Instagrams after interviews. Where can people catch up with um, what's happening in your world? Yeah, just, just search me on Instagram and I'm actually doing a bit of a day in the life of quarantine tomorrow. So anyone wants to see anything particular, just, um, yeah, it's Stubletty Zach or Zach Stubletty at on Instagram. Zach, thanks so much for joining me um, and everyone tuning in. Thank you so much. Just oh, quickly before we go, we had one comment uh, from Joe Baird on Facebook saying, Zach, you are my nine-year-old son's new hero. It's very nice to hear. <laughs> oh, we just have one more comment coming from Jin Kim. Uh, who are you closest to in the Dolphins swim team? Oh, that's tough. I mean, I've, re- I've, I've lived with Mac for the last, Mac Horton for the last three weeks. Um, while we're over in Tokyo. So fairly close with him. Um, definitely close with, obviously, my teammates from back home, like Jack McLaughlin and Leah Neal. Um, very, very close with them. And, yeah, I think, like, they're probably the the top three. And, yeah, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. You don't want to select too many people. Otherwise, you'll think, oh, no, who have I left out? Um, yeah. Zach, thank you again so much for joining me and everyone else tuning in. Make sure, keep up to date with quarantine questions. We'll be letting you know who the next guests are very soon. So we'll catch you next time.